um, if you're here for the thing where we do fun stuff with Elm and Phoenix and music and collaboration, then you're in the right room. And if you find yourself in the wrong room, stay anyway. It'll be fun. So uh, before we dig in, a little confession. I have a problem. So I have a pretty lengthy history of talking at conferences about other languages than the one a conference is for. So for instance, in ancient city Ruby, I talked about Elixir. At the first Elixir conf, I talked about Java, only a little. At the second Elixir conf, I talked about like building your own language and a little bit of Angular, which I do not recommend. And so of course this year, I'm gonna talk about Elm. Uh, not exclusively, we'll talk about Elixir and Phoenix too, so don't freak out, but uh, we'll spend more time on philosophy on the Phoenix front than we will on super interesting code, honestly. Uh, more, more about like things to think about. So let's talk about collaboration. Um, the easiest way to describe what collaboration is, is like multiple parties are editing and viewing some bit of shared state together. In this case, we're doing collaborative music, but the fundamentals are the important thing. So here we've called the shared state in this picture a thing that Alice and Bob are interacting with, but that thing could be a document or a game simulation or some database tables. But I think this one's really silly to think about because the database tables should be an implementation detail, right? So they shouldn't be collaborating on database tables almost certainly unless it's an application for interacting with a database. Like doing other stuff, they should be talking to some other abstraction. Or as is the case today, it could be some music. So there's our motivation and uh, let's talk about how we're gonna cover it. So we'll kind of have a speed reading discussion of kind of the fundamentals of collaboration. So we already talked about how it's fundamentally just like multiple parties working together on some shared state. So we didn't mention real time there. We didn't mention like the web or web sockets or any of that, right? So Phoenix gives us channels, and so because of that, now it's easy to do collaboration where it was hard earlier, right? Because WebSockets. But you don't need WebSockets for collaboration. You don't need WebSockets for Phoenix channels. You don't need the web to write collaborative software. You don't need real-time software if you're writing collaborative software. You don't need Ajax. Um, before Ajax existed, I had some creepy quasi-real-time collaboration in some apps that I wrote in VB6, no kidding, that uh, depended on hidden iframes, and like that all just worked fine. So this isn't new, honestly. And like normal CRUD REST interfaces are collaboration, right? What you're doing is you're collaborating on some shared data model, uh, just not real-time-ish. Um, and there's a lot of header overhead for HTTP requests, but most collaboration doesn't have to happen really quickly, so that's why you don't need WebSockets for a lot of stuff. But if you wanna do stuff and you wanna get like notifications quickly about things that changed and you expect to have lots of messages going quickly, then it sure would be nice to avoid all the header traffic around like the HTTP request. And that's really the only reason to care about WebSockets, honestly. Like there's the bidirectionality and there's that. So if you find yourself thinking, I can do this thing now because of WebSockets, probably you already could do that thing. Um, so what's nice though is that Phoenix channels make it easy to do collaboration. So like that may be at odds with what I just said, but the whole point is they do this by providing a really nice abstraction. And this abstraction could have existed way before WebSockets or anything else like that. So it's not a massively important point, but it's something I felt like I should mention because I've seen a lot of people talk about like, now I have WebSockets so I can build all this stuff, but like I was building that stuff before I had WebSockets. So that's not right. And if you think about it that way, you probably will make a lot of mistakes that lead to unhappiness down the line. So, yeah, so we could do HTTP streaming. As of 1998, when uh, the 1.1 spec was like not finished, but kind of mostly finished, you could do HTTP streaming. And HTTP streaming plus TLS has basically the same unidirectional performance characteristics as WebSockets do. Um, you have the same HTTP setup for the upgrade with WebSockets as you do for streaming, and then everything else is just messages down the wire. So. It's basically the same. The only difference is like when you're sending messages back up to the server, you're doing it through some other channel, and there you have some header overhead. Um, but the point is like, we've had iframes since 1996. We've had HTTP streaming since 1998. We could have been building this stuff that people think like, ah, cool, I can build it now. We could have built it for a really long time. Um, but people weren't, and that was because there weren't good abstractions. And there weren't things like the beam, right? So like, we know that to do this, actually you want to have a lot of processes out and running, and if that means you're writing a thread pool, you're probably not gonna do it because it's unpleasant. Um, anyway, so when you're extolling the virtues of Phoenix, the only reason I bring this up, uh, I think it's better to talk about the abstraction than it is to like jump to WebSockets um, because otherwise I think it misses the point. So now let me give you a dumb story that gives some good insight into what it means to not think properly about uh, the problems around doing some collaborative thing. 
Uh, we had a, at the time, potential customer. They did come on board as a customer uh, when I ran a consultancy. Get in touch with us because a contractor that was doing some other work for them, they had mentioned a few like little problems they were having, and he appreciated the like the corner they'd painted themselves into, and they didn't. So he told him to call me because he knew that I would be mean, um, and that it would make their lives better. So they said to me, "We have a small bug. Has anyone ever said this to you and been right, like ever?" Yeah. So at any rate, they didn't know that their problem was hairy. Um, so as they explained what they were doing, I kind of started to freak out. And I started to point out that they hadn't really likely addressed the, the concerns inherent in a distributed system. To which they replied that I was being a little, little bit dramatic because th this is not a distributed system. You're, you're missing it, Josh. Like, we just have a couple of people doing stuff together on the internet. Um, so ultimately, it was like two people. They had two people. It was a distributed system, though, and it had exactly those problems. So they're interacting with some shared state in a customer service like quoting app for this solar thing, solar panel installation thing. And it worked really, really well most of the time, but every now and then, like, the state would get out of sync between what the CSR was seeing and what the customer was seeing. And so this is just a little bug to fix, right? So when I explained that these weren't like little bugs, but fundamental misunderstandings in how they built their application, and in fact, they had to throw it all out, they got real sad. But eventually, they ended up with a really solid product. So the point is, you have to think about these things, and just using channels is not having a plan. Um, we have to build systems that are designed around the collaboration from the get-go if we want to do it, or else we're going to have the same problems even though we have Elixir, right? So I wrote a lot about like Leslie Lamport and total ordering and happened before and Lamport timestamps and vector clocks, but A, there's not enough time, and B, I would probably butcher it if I actually said it. Um, I'm glad to talk about all that stuff later if you want to talk about it, but um, the point is there are all these things that you should know about if you're building a distributed system or at least you need to know that it's okay to ignore them for very specific reasons. Now, in my example, we ignore them for very specific reasons, which is nice because it makes it easier to give the talk. Um, but one way we can sort of see the problem is like in a chat log. So the chat log is the, t and I say the chat log, a chat is the sort of traditional channels intro, right? And a chat, you can think of it as like this thing where you're talking to each other, but really it's collaborating on some state. The state that you're collaborating on is the chat log, like the stuff that happened historically. And so, in general, almost every Phoenix chat that you see, the example, is not, um, not like the stuff isn't really serialized. So like there's not a thing that owns the chat log so much, like the database does, right? It, it owns the chat log pretty much. But generally, in all the examples that I've seen, when you post a chat, like, you also show it in your interface, right? But if somebody else posted a chat, and that one made it to the server before you, then your interface doesn't reflect the true ordering of events, right? So you would show your chat here, but happening before the other guy, but the chat log on the database, which is the, you know, canonical source of truth, disagrees. And mostly, we just kind of hand wave about that and, and ignore it. But the point is, to get it right, you either have to have something like hard, like Paxos or Raft or something, or you need to have like just this one thing that, that owns it all and tells everybody what's what. Um, anyway, so I'm going to skip all the really confusing uh, or hard to talk about things with collaboration, but I'm glad to talk about them in the hallway if you want, um, and you can tell me how I'm wrong about them. But we will go on from there, and we'll talk about an application that I built in Elm and Phoenix. It exists as a kind of like introduction to doing real-time collaboration with these two things that are amazing. And the reason I wanted to give this talk is because I'm really, really happy when I write Phoenix and Elm stuff, like super happy, way happier than I ever have been before writing software. So this thing is called Colluder. Uh, you can get it on GitHub, it's right there. Uh, I'm neuter on GitHub because I thought that was really funny when I was 14, and we'll just go with it. So some of this stuff uh, was in a feature branch till like late last night, so it's all in master. Um, I was hiding it from people because I didn't want people to like jump the gun. It wasn't really well hidden, a feature branch, but uh, anyway. So it's an app in two parts. There's like the Elm piece, which is a front end. It's the place that my initial data modeling happened, which was uh, maybe weird for me because normally I would have like just built something in Elixir and then like made the front end do it. Uh, and then there's the Phoenix piece, which is an umbrella app. So I've been really, really happy you know, with Chris's talk, uh, the talk I just saw with Gary, um, so a couple other things where we seem to not be falling into the trap of let's just put all the business logic in our controllers and everything will be good. Um, really happy that that's not where the community is going. So just wanted to say uh, that makes me super thrilled. Um, anyway, so the point is, this is an umbrella app, and I'll sort of talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, 
So I'm on a bit of crusade to bring these two worlds together. Uh, they're really awesome apart. Uh, they're doubly awesome together. So when I was getting into some depth on this project, and I actually kind of like the harder parts of this project, uh, it inspired a tweet from me that expressed how I felt uh, pretty well. So I went to do something like kind of hairy, and it just worked. And it was how I'd always dreamt programming could or should be. Um, so yeah, I am absolutely full-on fanboy for both Elixir and Phoenix and Elm. Uh, they are freaking awesome, and they make me happy. But it's because they make my life as a programmer better. It's not just because, like, I don't know, I drank some Kool-Aid, I don't think, because uh, I built substantial stuff in them. So if you take nothing else away from the talk, like, fiddle with integrating Elm with your Phoenix app, see how you like it. Uh, on a mild sales-related note, I sell content at Daily Drip showing you how to do that. All right, so uh, let's demo the app in just a little bit, but first I want to talk about Elm. Um, so here's a higher level overview of how Elm applications work. And so it's a picture and maybe it's squirrely and confusing, but we'll talk through it. So the thing in the middle is the Elm runtime. And you can basically just kind of ignore it for now. Uh, so the whole system, like all of an Elm application works basically strikingly like a gen server. So in the white boxes, you see there are some types. So there's model and message, and these are the types that describe your system. So like the messages would be like the kinds of casts that could happen in your gen server and the model would be like the state of your gen server. Um, yeah, so that, that's all. And then there's those green boxes are four functions you create. So there's init, which produces your first model. Like this is init from gen server, we know it. Uh, update, which is like your handle cast, uh, pattern matching all these different messages. Uh, you have the view, which is a pure function from your model to the way your UI should look. And then you have subscriptions, which is just like stuff outside of your user interactions that you would like to deal with. So, for instance, timers or web sockets or something else. I don't know, anything else that you didn't initiate that came from the outside world. So from there, the Elm runtime wires all these things together for you. So when a user interacts with the view, uh, she might produce a message. And so the runtime gets that message and then pushes it and your current model back through your update function. And then you give it a new, up, a new model, and then it sort of replaces that under the hood, and then your view renders. So that's, that's sort of how it works. <coughs> Sorry, same thing with description, uh, subscriptions. So yeah, all these things are like strongly isolated. The thing that's really interesting is if you look at the model comma command message, that's a two tuple. So your update function returns two things completely separately. There is, this is how I want the state of my application to change. And then there is, gosh, it'd be nice if something happened like this outside in the real world. So that's those commands. It's like, it's data that says, It'd be nice if like a, an HTTP post happened, but you're not doing it because Elm functions are pure. So you can't interact with IO. That's why the runtime exists, honestly. You tell the runtime like, it'd be great if somebody would push this to that HTTP endpoint. And then it does it and it tells you how that went. But you didn't ever do anything in your functions that was impure. So that's like really nice. And in this whole description, I didn't have to say the word monad. So that's like one of the primary focuses that uh, Evan puts in to, to Elm, and I think, it has, I think it pays off a lot. Anyway, so now you totally understand how Elm works from top to bottom, so let's have a look at the Elm side of Colluder, which is the name of this thing. So I built this thing, and I'll turn it down a little bit. So it's kind of fun, you can kind of see, you can do some stuff. I'm doing all this without using my hands, it's crazy. So, you know, it's not like the end of the world, and this isn't collaborative yet. This is the Elm side. But it works, and it's kind of neat, and I will move on so that it stops making noise. There we go. So um, I've wanted to build something like that for a really long time, and it's not like it was hard, really. Like I, it's not like I couldn't with existing tools, but I was completely unwilling to because JavaScript. So I don't know if you know this, but JavaScript's horrible. It's like the worst thing. So like I could build it, and I built very large JavaScript things, and people paid me money, and they paid us a lot of money because they paid per hour, and we had to deal with JavaScript, so it took a long time. Um, so that part was good, maybe, but uh, maybe not so great for the economy, and certainly not so great for my sanity. So when I like I had this toy, and like nobody's paying me to build this thing, I just kind of want it to exist, and like I would go to do it some weekend, and I would be like, yeah, let's build this this toy. And then I'd open up a JavaScript file, and I'd be like, you know what, I can do my taxes instead. That's better. So. <laughs> It never happened. And then with Elm, like, I didn't have this concern at all. Like, I was excited to do it because it's not JavaScript, and it's a, it's a good language. It's really one of the best languages I've ever seen. Um, anyway, <coughs> also there's the collaboration piece. So before Phoenix, like, doing the bit that you haven't seen yet, where, like, multiple people can work on that same music at the same time, like, it was not a fun thing. I could do it with, like, 
any of a number of, of bad, wrong ways in, in Rails, and like they worked and they were fine, but they didn't scale. Like I built uh, actor model based systems in Ruby that had lots of users, and they generally were pretty good until I had a spike of traffic and 5,000 users, and then bad stuff, like 5,000 concurrent users, and then bad stuff happened. And I didn't want to do collaborative stuff that fell over in that way unless I took like extraordinary pains to fix it. So Phoenix fixes that, it's just, it just works, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, these two things together made it where instead of being really uncomfortable about building this thing, I was excited. So let's look at how the LMAP is built. And we will get to some, some Elixir code, I promise. Uh, so all LMAPs tend to look the same at the top level. So they look kind of like this. So we have some module named main, and it exposes all its functions. And here we're starting a program, and we just give it this initial state, we give it an update function, we give it a view function, we give it a list of subscriptions. Or really, we give it a subscription, but anyway. Um, and that's it, and it wires, the, the runtime wires all those together for us. So let's talk about the model, because this is where I start, like when I'm doing Elm stuff. And I, this is where I found it interesting, because I did model my, my problem in Elm instead of Elixir, whereas historically I definitely would have done it in Elixir first. Um, so okay, so we have some types. Uh, song is a dictionary with integer keys and tracks for values. Like realistically, this probably ought to be an array instead of an integer keyed dictionary. Uh, there, I might can justify this design, I'm not sure. I was basically future proofing against something that I still haven't run into, but I think I would, because I haven't yet allowed people to delete tracks. Yeah, anyway, not important to go into. The point though is, this is a really squirrely data structure and it'll, uh, it'll probably come up later. Uh, track, it's just a record containing a note. So each of those things across on the user interface you just saw was a track. And so like, there's the note it plays, and then there's some slots. And the slots are just another uh, integer key dictionary of true-false, of booleans. Um, yeah, so that's basically it for what a song is. And then we have our model. So like, there's all the other stuff that goes into building a, a thing in the browser. So like the top fields there, there's a lot of stuff that just helps us figure out if we've successfully initialized an audio context in the browser with web audio, and whether or not we can use aug or we have to use something else. Um, it has just a single field here that's holding the song, which is like the core data structure we're working with. It's got a few other things, like it knows where it, like the current note, that line that was going across as it played, that's all that was. It's just saying like, here's where we are in the song. Um, total notes probably shouldn't be in here. It should derive that from the song, but it's there. Um, paused, you know, are we playing or not? And then the beats per minute, like how fast are we playing? And then a few other things that don't really matter. And then those bottom two are really dumb, and we'll talk about those in detail later. So when you saw me building like the little dialogues to pick the note for a given track, it was doing some stuff that tweaks these fields, but that ends up being really stupid, but we'll talk about it later. So anyway, and then like that's the type, and here's what the initial model looks like. So you can basically, you, this is not that surprising, right? You saw the type, you mostly kind of could figure out what this stuff was gonna be, except for, you know, what is material.model, who cares? Okay, so I pre-populate like the song, I give it two tracks, they're both this uh, fifth octave A note, and they have 20 false slots. So it's not on, but it's 20 slots long. So that's super, super easy. It's immutable, right? I have an empty dictionary, I insert a track with key zero, I insert a track with key one. So that's it, now we have a model, it's important to be able to do stuff to your model, right? So that's where update comes in. So Elm is an immutable language. You can tell it's an immutable language because if it weren't, I wouldn't use it or talk about it or tell people to use it. Um, so yeah, this is ultimately has the same trick as a gen server for updating state, right? Which is just you loop on yourself. Um, so you can think of it as continuously, the way that I like to think about it, which I did not think about it this way uh, with gen servers, really until I got into like more, more deeply into functional programming, is like a fold across all the things that happen in your application with some initial state, right, through some function that modifies that state. So uh, however you want to think about it, I find that is a fun way to, like, feels more appropriate for me to think about it rather than like, oh, like I'm recursively calling this function, feels worse. Um, anyway, but that's not important. And so an update takes a message in a model and returns a model. The message is just like your handle, like your uh, event that you're handling in a cast in your gen server. So what kind of things happen in our app? A bunch of stuff. Um, this is awful and big and flat and it might seem overwhelming. Um, so I'm gonna break it out into a few different pieces. But in fact, it's not that bad to have a giant, overwhelming looking flat list like this. If you play with Elm and you're like, aha, I will start organizing day one, you're gonna be sadder than you would otherwise. Okay, so here's the web audio bits. 
I cribbed this from an existing open source project um, that got me like to sound font. So the audio is sound font, MIDI sound fonts playing via web audio. That's, that's how it was making noise. Um, so this part gets me that, and it's basically a few things that lets you talk back and forth to some ports that are happen like in JavaScript land that set up some stuff for you. Um, and so ports are how you interact with things outside of your system, right? This is a normal feeling to us in Elixir. That's what we do. We have ports if we want to interact with things outside of our system. Um, so one really cool part of ports in Elm is that they have a thing called um, border control. So Elm is super strongly typed, right? It's not, there's no dynamic typing at all. Um, so border control says that like when JavaScript tries to call into one of these ports to send us data, if we say we get an integer on that port and someone from the JavaScript side sends us like a string, like boogie, I don't know, uh, they fail on their side. Like they can't get stuff through border control. So we never have to deal with that situation. Like you never deal with, well, what if the data isn't what I thought it would be? So there's no defensive coding. Um, anyway, so the whole point though is having plumbed stuff with this little bit of stuff that happens, we can make noise in the browser. So then we want to talk to Phoenix. And I'll show you this bit a little bit later, but we have a message that tells us to connect to the socket. So this is like an event that we say, like, it sure would be nice if we connect to the Phoenix socket. And then um, that Phoenix message bit is how we interact with this Elm Phoenix socket uh, library that handles all the socket stuff for us. So if you don't know how Phoenix sockets work, you have the, um, there's like this ref that has to be different for every command that you send because you need to, it's asynchronous, but you want to combine, like when you're on a channel, you can reply to a message, but it's all async. So you have to have some way to tag the reply. And so that's what that whole thing is for. But it turns out that's like stateful. So there has to be a piece that handles it. And so this library handles that bit for you so you don't have to think about it. Um, and then we have this like receive state bit. So this is where we get a song back from the server. It's a JSON encoded value. And then, yeah, so this is how we handle that. Um, so I built a thing called, that, that supports Phoenix Presence. Uh, it's a library. I'm still trying to get it merged into Elm Phoenix Socket. It's since like two months old now at the pull request. I don't know why it's not merged yet. I'm probably gonna, anyway, the point is you can do, you can do Presence stuff too. But we're not doing it in here. Uh, so the actual app that you saw doing stuff is basically this bit. So we have a tick that happens based on the model's beats per minute, and that's what moves us on to the next note. We can check a slot on a given track, so when you click a track, that's what happens. Uh, to do that, we have to say what the track ID and the slot ID are, and we have to give it a true or false, bo like a Boolean. So this is what one of those messages is, right? It has these three values. Um, and these are, this is like a union type or an algebraic data type. If you hear those words, that's all this thing is. And it's a really fancy way of saying, like, there are only certain things that can happen. It's not, yeah, it's not, not hard. Um, and then like you can add a track, you can set the beats per minute, you can talk about whether or not it's paused, and then those last three bits, again, are the really dumb thing that we're gonna fix later that handles that kind of wizard view. Um, and then that brings us to the update function. So can everybody see this? Okay. Uh, we'll look at it piece by piece, and I'm gonna go real fast. So the first thing is, notice that I lied to you earlier. I said you got a message in a model and you returned a model. But really, we're returning the two tuple, right? The model and the command message, because we want to do stuff in the outside world. We want to interact with WebSocket. So we have to, and we also want to interact with JavaScript runtime. So we have to have kind of this two tuple version, because otherwise we're completely pure and we can't do anything with the outside of the Elm runtime. Um, anyway, and so this first basic bit just like initializes an audio context. There's some JavaScript that sets up a graph uh, using the Web Audio API, make sure we can use AUG. This bit's kind of boring too, right? It just loads the web fonts for us, so we'll, we'll skip that bit. But you can kind of see what this is, right? Just update our model uh, every time we get one of these events. Or we send something out. So that, actually, I will point that out. So like most of these, I can't point, but um, that top one, right, it updates our model, it doesn't send anything out. The next one doesn't do anything to our model, but it does send something out. So a lot of times there's this like segregation where you're not doing, you're doing one or the other. Uh, I find this compelling, but you can't always do it without feeling like you're making stuff hard on yourself for no good reason. Anyway, so now we get to the UI messages. So if somebody clicks the pause or play button, we toggle the model's pause field. Cool, like just not model.pause. That's all that looks like. When somebody sets the BPM, we just set the BPM to whatever they sent us. And then we have the subscription that's happening in the back end. So like every time.minute times the interval, we send a tick message to ourselves, and that's what moves along the simulation. And so like if we're paused, we're just not sending that subscription across. So I find, I find this interesting. Um, anyway, and so we get our tick values, and when those happen, we call out to update notes, which is a horribly named function. All that it does is literally like some mod math on current node. It probably shouldn't be its own function. I don't know why I did this. 
And then once we've done that, we request some notes. So we get all the notes like based on where we are in the song. We should find out, hey, like, are any of the tracks on at this point in time? And if they are, cool, like, will you play that note for me? That's all this does. Um, and that gives us a song playing thing, which is cool. And then, like, when a user clicks a slot, we have to trigger a thing, so we, we go do that. We update the, the track with a new slot. Um, when they set the note for a track, we update that track to play that MIDI note. Uh, when you add a track, we add a new track. We just generate one with the right size and slap it on the end. And this is the wizard bit. So like when you click on like the A5 or whatever, it sets this editing track. And because an editing track is set to something, just something rather than nothing as a maybe, then it shows that first dialog. And then when you click a thing, it sets the note. And because that's set, it shows the second dialog. But there's not like a connection of these things in the data model, which, is, which means it's possible to do buggy things. And we can get around that later. Um, anyway, and finally, once you actually choose your octave, we have all the three bits of data that we needed, so we send the real message that we cared about, which updates the model. And then this part's like squirrely and ugly looking, right? God help us, this is big and like, I don't like it. Um, and this is because of the other stuff I mentioned that we're gonna fix later. Like there's just all this stuff that sucks a little bit about this. Um, but what's nice is in Elm, every expression, sorry, every function has a single expression. Uh, there isn't, it's not an imperative thing. There's one thing you do. And if you wanted to do some other stuff, you can't really do it imperatively. What you can do is like have a let expression that lets you set up some things to set variables, but they're not done in order or anything. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you're not gonna be able to do kind of imperative coding in Elm at all, um, which is nice. So the whole point though is we needed these three values and we had to get them through these other real squirrely places uh, to build this up. So this brings us to the Phoenix socket connection bit. So when you say, hey, I'd like to connect to a socket, we create this new data structure that represents our socket. We get an updated version of it. We have a command to send to our runtime that like actually does the connection bit. And then we tack on basically this callback thing that says, look, when I get a collusion state back, uh, just receive that state and that'll give us a new message. Uh, and we'll keep moving. Receive state basically, we try to decode it. If we can't decode it, I'll log it to the console and don't do anything, right? Don't update my model. But if I could decode it, then I got a song back, so I replaced my song. So this is the bit where we get to ignore all the hard stuff about synchronization because we're serializing access to this thing, and so basically we replace the song entirely every time somebody sends anything new, and we send it out to everybody. Um, so this is dirty. This doesn't work for all kinds of things you might want to do. So like if you're making a game, like Quake or something, like you can't send the whole state of the world every tick of the game to everybody. That's an awful experience. But if you're doing the song, it's okay. So I get to like hand wave the hard parts. But you get a good experience when like. With this setup, I've been able to like think about those hard parts a lot more simply than other times I've done stuff like this outside of Elm and Phoenix. Anyway, and then if some other messages come in from the Phoenix integration, like a heartbeat or whatever, they get tagged by, we, we basically pass them down to this other component that we don't care about, that we were given, and it does the right stuff. And then we get to the view, and I'll kind of go through this somewhat, somewhat quickly. So your view, as I mentioned, is a pure function that translates your model into an HTML tree, and the user can produce messages in your application by interacting with it. So this is the function that handles like the primary middle part of our, of our view. So the bits above are just managing some like header, we don't show those, and doing some material design wrapper stuff. So here we've got some basic styles we're injecting, and then you can see the pieces of our application that are rendered as children of this parent div in a list. So we'll see those with a screenshot. So we view metadata, that's that top bit. The top controls are the pause and BPM bit. The song editor is that piece with the, the tracks and the add track, and then the connection is that button, right? And then I kind of don't show the dialogue yet. So view metadata, super easy. I just wanted to show you what this stuff looked like, right? So this is just generating HTML. It's a div. The second argument is like a list of attributes. The third thing is a list of children. So this just has a text notice child, and it shows that stuff. That's, I don't think this is terribly hard to, to read. The hardest thing would be like syntax, little, little syntax things about Elm that maybe feel squirrely, like the fact that space means apply a function. Um, so then there's some more UI components, right? The top controls. These might look kind of squirrely because I'm using material design, so like you're like, whoa, there's like six lines of stuff to make a button, why? Um, but reasons is why. Uh, but it's not uncomfortable, like this is uh, very pleasant to work with. Uh, it's way better than like untyped HTML, just like I will type some text and then later on I will find out that it was completely invalid according to the W3C, but I won't care. Um, that's not really a thing for the most part here. And then there's like the song editor, so 
uh, kind of abstracted out. We have a table, has a row for tra each track in our song, and then it has this add track button. And so we just fold across all of our tracks to produce the TRs for the table. This is what a given track looks like. So um, again, we have this metadata bit up front that lets you change the, the song, uh, the note, but then we just fold across all the slots to produce the TDs of the row. And then this is what a TD is, basically. So if it is the currently playing note, it has this kind of black bar on the right. If it's checked, it's red. And yeah, we just apply those, those classes to this uh, TD as we produce it. And then we have like track metadata. This is the button you can click. So when you click this, it says, okay, I'm gonna set the track that you're editing. And so we do that. And now we have this view dialog function. It says, look, if there's a track being edited, then when somebody views the dialog, they should see this track note chooser. And that looks like this. And it says, well, if you already picked the note, then we'll show the octave dialog. But if you haven't, we'll pick the note dialog. And this is kind of a bunch of like stateful wizard stuff that is not defined strictly. This is just like, I happen to know that this is what I want to happen. But it's, you know, someone else coming in wouldn't understand necessarily that that's why these things happen. So this is bad, and we'll talk about it like, like I mentioned later. But I just wanted you to see all this stuff. So the note dialog, we make some buttons for each note. Each one of those is going to emit some message. The octave dialog, same, same sort of deal. And then there's this beat that lets you click and it'll connect to the back end, which gets us to the Phoenix channels. So that first bit was all me proselytizing for Elm really hard, and I thought it was worth doing because last year's Elixir Comp is where I really, really got sold on Elm um, in the, one of the keynotes. And if a single person leaves here today thinking they want to give Elm a try, I feel like I did a good thing and they got their money's worth out of the conference. Um, but now we can talk about the Phoenix application. So I think that I mentioned that Chris's keynote was awesome because I think it's what Phoenix needed to help people uh, not fall into the Rails as my application trap in Phoenix. Um, so I want to kick this off with a preface. I'm pretty dumb. I used to think I was smart, and it turns out no. So I'll show you why that is. I'm constantly telling people, like beating this drum about Rails is not your app, Phoenix is not your app, whatever. So I went to start the collaboration part of this application. And imagine my dismay when I saw what I had done. I typed these lines right here, and I made this commit, and I felt good about it for about 10 seconds. But like, look here. Uh, we want to make it possible to have some music editor that's collaborative. So I'll be like clicking around a bunch, and so will you, and so all this stuff will be happening. And any update's going to have to wait for the database to persist if we do this. But also, I never said I wanted to store this stuff in a database. I just kind of did it, because I was on autopilot. So there's nothing relational about this data. It's a big blob that makes up a song. So why did I use a relational database to store? And the answer is because I'm dumb, super dumb, and I shouldn't be. So I killed this with fire, and I replaced it with an umbrella application. And so here we have two things. I have that top bit, which is Collusions, which is an OTP application that manages a gen server and like some supervisors for doing like song collaboration around a data structure. And then we have this OTP app that has no views, has no ecto, no anything. It just has a channel for sending messages into the OTP application. So yeah, that's nice. So here's the same state that we had in the Elm application, but ported to Elixir, and I'll run through it fairly quickly, but this is all it looks like, right? So it's got the awful data structure where we have uh, keys that are integers um, in a map, but whatever. And then there's this gen server that wraps the state. Once again, everybody can read that, right? Okay, so it's a normal gen server. Like, we register it when we start it, uh, we, so we have a name. So when somebody tries to start a song with a given name, we start it if it didn't exist. But if it did exist, we say, like, Sure, that worked, guy, but we give him the one that was already running. Um, I don't know if this is smart, but it works for me. Uh, we get some state out of it, so like, I'd like to know what tracks there are, how many there are, and honestly, all this stuff is really just so that I can write tests. And then you can do all the stuff that you could do with our messages, right? You can set a slot, you can set a note, you can add a track, and then you can get the state, because it would be nice for us to be able to tell people what the song looks like. Um, and so I think that the fact that these things map so perfectly to the message, that portion of the messages is kind of why there's like the a lot of people in the Elm community are like, why are so many Elixir people coming in? Because shouldn't we be using Haskell on the back end? And like, maybe, but not me. Um, so I think I know, I think this is sort of the reason that Elixir people feel so comfortable with Elm, because we know gen servers, and it's kind of the Elm architecture. And so like, our server API looks kind of like we'd expect. Uh, we handle all these things, and we do some stuff, and it's not terribly important. You could sort of figure out how to modify the state. I just wanted to show it for completeness. A little bit more, it's a little lengthy, but it represents everything we do to do all of this stuff. So uh, we'll recap what we saw before. We had an Elm application that did neat stuff with music. We've recreated that data structure and all the individual actions, and we made gen servers that can manage the state for one of those things. And we made channels that can, I haven't done the channels yet, that's what's next. Oh, one more thing. Um, 
There are tests. I think tests are super important. I'm not going to show them now, but you should know that I wrote them, and I wrote them first because I'm not a monster. So now we have the gen server. We'd like to be able to modify it when you make changes in your Elm application. And so our casts map one to one of the messages in Elm. So if we could just like send those messages across when we do stuff, then it'll work, right? So again, our app is the gen server. It's not the Phoenix bits. But the Phoenix bits are what enable us to do this part. So the user talking to and hearing from our app over web standards, that's what Phoenix is for. That's what a web framework is for, the web bits. So we're going to slap a channel around the gen server. <coughs> so here's the general idea. Um, they're just an interface to our gen server. Uh, they embrace it. They mediate access to it. But they're not it. Um, so here's a quick channel. It has stuff that you would expect. Um, when you connect to a channel, we start it. And you know, if it already existed, then we acted like we started it. When you send us these sort of, we basically define a protocol for the messages you can send across the WebSocket or across the channel, and we translate those into the function calls on the gen server. And so this is, you know, I'll show it all for completeness, but you can go look at the repo if you'd like to see how it works. So let's see this in a demo for reals. Uh, I've got it running on ingrok, and I'll visit that. It's right here. You can all hop on it if you want. Um, and I guess you're going to have to get it out of my uh, browser. Here, hold on a second. I have to do this. And then I have to do this and maybe make you big. OK, so there it is. And we'll just unpause it real quick. And you can do stuff, right? So if somebody wants, oh, one thing. You have to click Connect to back end. OK, so yeah. Yeah, people are doing stuff. Sweet. So now you can go through and you can like change notes and edit this thing. And it all just works. And it's awesome. And in general, if you have a really basic data structure, this kind of thing works the most. Um, oh, I don't want to make a seven. That's not at all what I want. So play. It's fun. Um, I don't know. So like I've wanted to build this for a long time, and it was not hard at all. And in the past, it would have been kind of hard, and I would have worried about like all the collaboration bits, and I didn't have to because like Phoenix and, and Elixir are pretty good. So I don't know. It's kind of awesome to build this in just a few hundred lines of code, I think. Um, but whatever. And this is, huh? Uh, what do you ask? Uh, there's a rate limit? Oh. Awesome. OK, we've been rate limited. That's fine. Uh, so anyway, so uh, yeah, the, the point is it's really fun to do. and. Uh, I will now go back to this bit, if I can find it. So anyway, um, but this is dumb, right? I'm sending the state every time anybody does anything. I'm sending the state to everybody. And so this might work with songs that are like 40 or so booleans, but what about some complicated state? Don't you want to just like send a diff or something smart? And the answer is like, totally, yes, you do want to do that. Don't do the dumb thing in general. It works for this. That's why I'm showing this off. Uh, but it's not really hard, right? So you have like this gen server bit, and it can know what a given connected client knows about and what it's seen. And so you can just have some algorithm there that figures out, oh, like these are the diffs that I need to send you. And you could even figure out, like, well, I really need to send you like six messages, but I know that that would be more data than sending you the whole state. So maybe I just send you the whole state this time. So the point is, you put that stuff there, like in the, in the channel, put that sort of algorithm there, and it has it's no relation to the rest of the app, right? That's just the part for communicating the diffs. But the interesting thing is you can do all that because you can think about your application because like it's, it's sort of broken out. Um, also, Quake World. So Quake World is awesome. If you want to do uh, any kind of like collaboration stuff, like you should probably read how Quake World came to be because it's really neat. Uh, that's actually what I'll be doing for the next month. Um, anyway, but the point is this is pretty cool. Um, and yeah. Few other tiny things I'd mentioned repeatedly that that wizard was awful. So this is something that Elm taught me that I hadn't learned before, and so it's that you can make invalid things impossible to represent. So before I could have had like the second step in my wizard set, but the first one not set. So if somebody forgot to update that correctly, then I'd have like an invalid state in my wizard and not what I wanted the user to see. But it would type check, right? It would be correct but buggy. So if you don't remember, this is what that looked like. It was a couple of maybes. And we kind of inferred from the maybes like this other stuff, like this bit right here. But why did we have to infer it at all? Because we're the ones writing the code. So instead of those maybes with state that's like intermediate that I don't actually care about, I can have this. So there's a union type for the note chooser wizard. It can be either pending or there can be a track being edited. 
or they could be a chosen note. And then I just store that on my model. So I'm not storing intermediate state, I'm storing the state machine, right? And then it's impossible to set it to an invalid state. It's just, there's just not an option. Like those are the only three things it could be and none of those are in invalid state. So that's pretty good. Um, and so then it kind of like this stuff is still pretty straightforward. This, this bit gets a little smaller, still a little bit wider than I want it to be because of that sort of maybe there and I can fix that. One of the things that like when we come back here, uh, I had a couple of people when I showed this to them go, ah, yes, use monads and it'll fix this. Be oh, sorry, this is the wrong slide. Say, ah, yeah, use monads and it'll fix this. Just use like maybe and then or something. And that's sort of right, but the whole point is it misses the point. The point is I can make it impossible to make an invalid state. So it's not about making this code easier to write or easier to read. It's about making it impossible to do dumb things later down the road. Uh, and so that's what this whole pattern gives us and I like it. Um, so now I can't make some unreasonable state for the UI and I find that interesting. But that's really all I have. Thanks for listening. Um, if you get nothing else out of this, uh, play with Phoenix and Elm together. Come talk to me. I will uh, proselytize even further. So thanks very much. Oh, yeah. Hi, could you talk a little bit more about ports? Um, I'm still a little confused how you get Elixir and Elm to talk to each other. Oh, uh, so you break out at Elm. So ports for Elm specifically are about talking to, I'm gonna say JavaScript because that's really a front end language right now, but so they're about talking to JavaScript. So they're about providing uh, this nice boundary where when you wanna do something in JavaScript, you can have two things in Elm. You can have an inbound port or an outbound port. So an outbound port is basically, I'd like to send some value out that maybe I can't, maybe I don't have a library that I wanna do something with in JavaScript, uh, in Elm, but I do in JavaScript. So I send some value out and then I subscribe to that port on the JavaScript side and so anytime a value comes in, I call some function with that value. So that's what outbound ports look like. Inbound ports are, and the way that it works is when you embed your application in uh, the HTML file, you have like some var app equals elm.main.embed or whatever. And so now you have an app and it has like app.ports.any inbound ports that you can call and any outbound ports that you have a subscribe function on. So you can just say like, I like to subscribe to this port and do stuff with it. Um, so does that answer the question? Okay. And then like on the inbound side, on the Elm side, they actually come in as subscriptions because again, they're kind of stuff that happened in the outside world that you didn't initiate. And any of that stuff is a subscription. Um, any other questions? Um, hey, great talk by the way. Um, when you put up a post, uh, sorry, you put up a slide saying, I love Elm and Phoenix and there was something in the middle. Is that like uh, the library that kind of helps you to bind the two together? Uh, which? Like Elm dash something. Oh, Elm Phoenix socket. Did I show that? Oh, Elm MDL. Okay, yeah. So no, that is completely unrelated to Elm to to Phoenix. That's literally Material Design. Uh, um, so I use Material Design stuff in here. So the thing that helps you bind the two together is called Elm Phoenix socket. And yeah, so like that's that Elm Phoenix socket is is this guy up there in that picture. Um, but yeah, basically it makes it very easy to interact with, with the sockets from a pure Elm library. Um, and it just works and it's good. Yeah. Okay, I think it's time for lunch. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.